So about every year, we take the staff and we go off and have a leadership retreat. And they're usually pretty focused and intentional and dive into some heavy-duty leadership concepts. But we've just decided that we always make room for one significant game. Because Mariah McManus-Goss and Brooke odom Figueroa have this unique gift of inventing games, like the Squid Games. So every year we have our own version of Squid Games, and we divide everybody in half, and then we go to war. Now, this is not related, but my team has always won. And I think that to be factually accurate. Yes. And, uh, and yet one year, when I think when they did the first one, they divided us up, we had all these obstacles, all of these challenges. But they added a component where each team had one spy. One person on our team that actually belonged to the other team. And one person on the other team that actually belonged to us. And their job as the spy was to not be discovered, but to subvert that team's success without ever being caught. Now, what was ironic was probably the most trustworthy, honest, gracious, lovable human being, Chad Brokaw, <laughs> suddenly became the target of everyone's suspicion. And he spent the whole game going, I'm not the spy. I'm not the spy. I'm not the spy. And of course, we all said, that's what a spy would say. <laughs> he goes, it's not me. It, he came to me because he thought somehow I could you know, advance his cause. He goes, it's not me. I said, yeah, that's how a spy would look. And, and, and the ironic thing was, he wasn't the spy. He was actually telling the truth. <laughs> because the spy was very good. There's an unfair advantage when you have a covert asset. There's a covert advantage you can actually place when you're at war. Because there, there is the overt strategy of it's me against you. But the covert is when you think us is us, but it's not completely us. Have you ever felt like there's a covert enemy inside of your brain? Like someone in your head that's working towards your disadvantage, telling you that you're not good enough, telling you that you don't have enough talent, telling you that your character is too fragile, telling you that you're not tough enough, telling you that what everyone else thinks about you is an overestimation of your talent. You're going to get caught one day. Yeah, you ever feel like you have a covert enemy inside of your own head? But the problem is that it sounds just like you because it is you and it looks just like you but it's, uh, it's the culmination of all those voices in your life that you were afraid were telling you the right thing because they were telling you you were less. And you believe them, so you added it to your identity. And then those outside voices became your voice. And so the ironic thing is sometimes in the battle of life, you are your own covert disadvantage. You're at war against yourself, or at least the best version of yourself. And then we enter into this faith journey where God is calling us to be more than we could ever imagine, to live a life that's bigger than ourselves, to step into an adventure that's filled with mystery and uncertainty and danger and complexity, and it's terrifying. And what we don't realize is that God is actually incredibly strategic because he has given himself a covert advantage. And that's what I want to talk about just for a few moments today is the covert advantage of God that you may be unaware of and not really actualizing because of this lack of awareness. In Hebrews chapter 8, beginning in verse 10, I'll read through verse 13, the writer of Hebrews, who I think is a guy named Apollos, wrote this. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after the time declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. Now, what he's talking about in Hebrews is he's actually quoting Ezekiel and Jeremiah. 
So he's pulling references from the Old Testament, from the Old Covenant. And now he's creating a contrast with a new covenant that becomes what the New Testament is formed around. And so some of the backdrop is remembering that that God has always been intentional at calling humanity back to himself. Even when we war against his intention and we don't realize what we need is him, he's always fighting for us. He's not fighting with us or against us. He's actually fighting for us, even though when you're fighting against someone who's fighting for you, it may feel like they're fighting against you. And so what ends up happening is you have this old covenant, and a lot of people understand the old covenant being God's covenant with Israel. That's that's a very simplistic way of understanding it. God's covenant was with humanity, but it began with Israel. So when God was having conversations with Jacob over Israel, and when God was calling out Abram or Abraham, and when God was talking to the nation of Israel about they're being his chosen people. They were chosen for a very specific thing. They were chosen so that the whole world would know they were chosen. He didn't choose one nation against all the other nations. He didn't choose one nation as opposed to all the other nations. He chose one nation because he was choosing all the nations and he had to begin somewhere. And so he wasn't choosing them first because he loved them most. He chose them first because he gave them the most responsibility. And his love was given to them because of the sacrifice they would have to carry. But it, the message got lost. Because it, have you ever noticed sometimes someone can tell you something, but you hear what you want to hear and not what you actually were told? And, and so when God said, I chose you because I'm choosing you so that all the nations would know they're chosen. In fact, it says to Abraham, I'm blessing you so that you can be a blessing to all the nations. Somewhere along the way, the second half of that conversation got lost. He chose us. He blessed us. And they forgot the second part of the conversation. He chose us so that all the nations would come to him. He blessed us so that we could be a blessing to all the nations. And that second half wasn't as attractive. I like just being chosen just for me. In fact, I'm not special if you get chosen too. I need you to not be chosen so that I can be more special by being chosen. And that's so part of the human dilemma, isn't it? It's not enough for us to win. Someone has to lose. It's not enough for us to be chosen. Someone has to be unchosen. But God's not like that. He chooses first because he knows whoever is chosen first carries the greatest burden. And for him, the burden of saving humanity is actually a blessing. It's a gift that you're given. If you can swim and everyone else is drowning It's not simply a gift so that you can survive, that you can swim. You're supposed to use the ability to swim to save those who cannot swim. And and so that's a part of the conversation that's going on here. But have you ever noticed that the history of all human institutions are control? Governments are established to control us. Religions are established to control us. And they're very complicated, just like governments are, whether they're socialists or capitalists or democracies or republics or dictatorships. Basically, every government has one overarching goal, control humans. Get people to cooperate and act the way we need them to act. And religions are incredibly complex. You can have lots of gods like Hinduism, no gods like Buddhism, or no gods like atheism, and one god like Islam. You can have really complex views of God. But really, the purpose of religion is to control people, to get us to act right. And then we sort of decide which rules kind of apply to us, right? Even when we're part of a country. I mean, everyone here, I'm looking at you, you're you're all lawbreakers. Every one of you, I can tell, (laughs) just by looking at you. All right, let's just, we didn't do this earlier, but we're small, intimate, we can do this. (laughs) How many of you have never broken the speed limit? Look at the criminal element in this room. (laughs) Every one of you have broken the speed limit. All right, how many of you ever seen someone run a red light? Not that you ran it, you saw someone run a red light. And did you think to yourself, they need to be arrested? 
right? Because you know the laws you do not break should be reinforced. <laughs> How many of you saw someone else speeding more than you and you thought, how reckless. Because <laughs> you know you're speeding at just the right speed. You're not reckless. You're just being reasonable. That guy going faster than you. And you know what's really going on? He has more courage than you. <laughs> so he's able to break the law even more than you and you're jealous. And so you say, that's wrong. How many of you have ever would never run a red light, but have done the uh, slow and roll at a stop sign. Thank you for being so honest. <laughs> you know you've done it. I I've been in the car driving, Kim's like, that, that was a stop sign. Oh, thank you, honey. <laughs> and I said, I saw it as I slowed down. And, uh, and I, in my mind, stopped. Have you ever thought you stopped enough? You stopped enough to obey the law. And there's no cars around you. I remember one time I was on this road in the middle of night, in the middle of nowhere, and the light was red. You ever been there? Nothing for miles. And I'm sitting at a red light, thinking to myself, do I run it? <laughs> you wait and you wait and you wait. You think, it's broke. Have you ever told yourself that? It's broken. The law is broken, but the light is not. What is it about us that we need laws to tell us how to cooperate with each other? Even all the way back to the Ten Commandments, those are laws that teach us how to survive in community with each other. The difference is that governments control us by threatening our freedom, and threatening punishment. Those are two very effective tools, I think. Religion uses different tools, guilt and shame. So the government will say, if you break this law, I will send you to prison. And religion say, if you break this law, I will send you to hell. It's, it's like, it's two different strategies. And for some people, one works better than the other. They're all the same. They all have the same strategy to change us from the outside in. To manage our behavior through external constraints. And you know how well that works. Sometimes it works well because you're afraid. Sometimes it works well because you're ashamed. But it leaves you in turmoil because you're choosing a behavior that is not reflective of who you really are. That's what happens in parenting. And some of you are too young to have children who have now moved to adulthood. But it's part of the crisis. Everyone has a perfect child until they're like 10. And then you go, I don't know what happened. Peer influence, the world, education, Social media. Somebody corrupted them. What actually happened was that your child began to express who they really were, not who you had imposed for them to be. And sometimes it's a, it's a painful, disrupting realization that we, we controlled their behavior, but we didn't somehow shape their internal values. Because it's a really complicated thing. And so here you have in Hebrews, God actually saying, I'm establishing a new covenant. If you could say it this way, a new strategy. A new approach toward human transformation. And the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to remove all external forces to try to make you something. That's insane, by the way. That strategy is called grace. Grace. See, when God says, I'm going to give you grace, which means once you're in relationship with me, you never lose it. No matter how much you mess up, no matter how many other people reject you, I will never reject you. I'm going to give you this, this essence called grace, 
And it's a terrible strategy if you're trying to focus on human behavior. Can you imagine what, would, what, you, what you would have done when you were 10 years old if your parents said, we're going to live by grace. You can do whatever you want. And it's okay. We've already forgiven you. I'm going, I did the jackpot. There's no way. Can you imagine government saying, we're just going to create a society based on grace. You just do what you feel like you should do. But we're never going to take away your citizenship. We're never going to take away your freedom. It's going to be okay. And so God establishes this environment, this culture of grace, saying you will always be loved. You will always be forgiven. You will always be accepted. And I'm sitting here thinking to myself, do you really want to lose all your leverage points for human behavior? Wouldn't it be better, God, if you said, if, if is powerful, if you do the right things, if you do what I want, if you live up to the standard, if you do this and not this, if is so powerful, and God removes the if, how in the world is he going to create a better world if he removes the if? And here it is his covert advantage. This is the new covenant I will establish. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their people. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. And so what God is saying, I'm, I'm removing all the constraints of obligation. And I'm going to trust the power of transformation to make you who you're created to become. Now he's echoing what Ezekiel said and what Jeremiah said in Ezekiel 36 verses 26 and 27 Ezekiel says this describing the shift from an old covenant to a new covenant he says I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you and I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws now the Bible is full, full of such extraordinarily powerful metaphors and images, but this is not one of them. If I've ever read an underwhelming metaphor or imagery, it's right here. Because God, like, I'm going to do something new. I'm going to create a new covenant. I'm going to give you a new heart, a new mind, and a new spirit. I'm going, this is incredible. He goes, this is how, it's, how I'm going to do it. I'm going to remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I have two basic problems with that. One, I'm not that excited about a heart of flesh. How about you? It's like, I'm going, like, really? Iron Man did better than that. I, I, like, you know, it's like, I, I want whatever. What was his heart? Vibranium? <laughs> whatever it was, it was just more impressive than a heart of flesh. I mean, I... I want something. I want like a heart made from some kind of divine essence, right? I'm going to take away from you your human heart and give you like a divine heart or, or, or infinite heart or whatever it might be, an angel dust heart, something, something that's a little more impressive than a heart of flesh. And that only becomes extraordinary when you see the contrast. Because I'm going to give you a heart of flesh, and the reason that should be so extraordinary it's extremely significant to you is because what you're starting with is a heart of stone. Now, you should have had a heart of flesh from the beginning. That's how I designed you. That's how I created you. But what you have actually is a heart of stone. And, and, and so the reason having a heart of flesh may not seem that extraordinary gift to you is that you don't understand that what you have right now isn't what I intended for you to have, that you actually are less than your intention. Which I think is interesting because the image of a heart of stone implies that there's a, a rigidity to us, a hardness, an inflexibility, 
a dogma. Have you ever noticed how odd it is that for too long and too often, we've confused people having character with people being rigid and dogmatic? Like, when, when, you, when you go across, like, religious environments, it's the really dogmatic people who are the ones who, quote, really know God. It's the rigid, unchanging ones, the ones that have rules, the ones that insist on all the rituals and routines. They're, they're, the, they're the spiritual ones, right? The ones with hearts of stone. And in fact, that's why across the world, religion is known for being so condemning and so judgmental because we're proud of our heart of stones. See, I have core beliefs. You can't change me. I act this way because that's proof of my character. I think it's one of the number one reasons why so many kids run from God. Because their parents claimed to be deeply spiritual, deeply religious, deeply connected to God. And they were some of those rigid, judgmental, condemning people that you could ever experience. And unfortunately, sometimes parents did it so sincerely because they thought that's what God demanded. They thought that character was being rigid, inflexible, unchanging. But that was not a reflection of character. It was a reflection of arrogance that we believe that we're right. Ironically, the best description of character is flexibility, adaptability. So he says, I'm gonna take away your heart of stone. What he's really saying is, you're not going to be rigid and unchanging and dogmatic anymore. Because flesh is incredibly adaptive, way too adaptive if you eat too much, right? <laughs> and, uh, your flesh is, is flexible and adaptive. It's warm. It, it exudes humanity. It's, it's, it's the beauty of embrace when it's flesh to flesh. There's something magical when you hold hands and you feel the flesh touch. It's two humans connecting at the deepest level. You say, I'm going to take away your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And, and by the way, in the scriptures, the best characteristics of character are humility, gratitude, faithfulness. Humble people are the most flexible people in the world. The more arrogant you are, the more inflexible you are. The more humble you are, the more adaptive and flexible you are. In fact, that's one of the best ways to find out if you actually are humble. People say, how do I know if I'm humble? Because once I think I'm humble, I won't be humble anymore. Oh, no, don't think about humility. Think about flexibility. See, humble people are actually teachable. Humble people are painfully aware that they could be wrong. Humble people are always ready to grow. Humble people don't hold on to their position when they realize their position is wrong. Humility is the promise of the greatest level of flexibility, adaptability, and pliability. When you're humble... It doesn't make you less when you say, I was wrong. It doesn't make you less when you go, wow, I have to change my mind. It doesn't make you less. In fact, humility gives you the flexibility to get on your knees, the flexibility to get on your face, the flexibility to serve, the adaptability to change. In the same way with gratitude, gratitude actually moves you from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh. Have you ever noticed that ungrateful people are rigid and unchanging? When you're around an ungrateful person, you can't change their position or their perspective. It's never enough. You're never enough. They're always underserved. They're under, underappreciated, always underappreciated. Un lack of gratitude actually rigidifies your heart. It makes it impossible for you to experience the love and compassion and acceptance of other people. Which, by the way, is why you think when you're ungrateful that no one loves you, that no one's there for you, no one shows up for you. It's because your heart of stone can't experience what others are actually sending your way. So maybe this imagery is more powerful than we think. 
that he takes away your heart of stone and gives you a heart of flesh and makes you human again. And he says that I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees. I've always been just mesmerized by this description. I found it decades ago when I was new in my faith. And, and what I noticed there says, I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to give you a new mind. And I'm placing in you a new spirit. But the change is this. You will move from the inside out, not from the outside in. It says, I will put my spirit in you and you and I will move you to follow my decrees. There's a fine line, and you discover it eventually in your life, between doing things because you're afraid of the consequences and doing things because you love the virtue. And you can do things for so long just because you're afraid of what it looks like if you don't do them. And then one day, you might actually no longer have that fear, and then suddenly you're doing things you never thought you would do. But one of the most beautiful thing is if we could just reverse that. When I, when I came to faith in Jesus, I was around 20 years old. And, and you know when I knew it was real? I knew it was real on a day when I wasn't anywhere near my family. I wasn't anywhere near my friends. I wasn't anywhere near anyone that mattered to me in their opinion. I had no social pressure to be better. I could be anyone I wanted to be. And all of a sudden, when I was all alone, I realized I actually want to be the best version of me. I was shocked. Like, I, I honestly, I was shocked because I realized there's no external pressure on me to be something or someone. I just want to be this person. Because at that point, I had not yet understood God's covert advantage. Because what God did is he changed me from the inside out. He got behind enemy lines, got into my soul, changed my heart, my mind, put in me a new spirit. I'm going, oh, I'm going to win. Because I'm winning from the inside out. problem is that everyone can't see how good I'm doing on the inside out battle. Sometimes they just see how bad I'm doing on the outside in battle. And, and that's why sometimes people will look at you and go, yeah, you haven't changed. It's because changing your actions is a consequence of changing you. And, and so the, the changing you t process takes a little time. And it's, it's so deep inside of you that others can't see it. In fact, at first, you can't even see it. You don't even realize you've changed until you realize you don't want what you used to want. Now you want what you wanted to want but now you do want it. You with me? And you're just shocked. You're going, what happened? Someone got into me. Because when you have a new heart, God changes what you want. When he gives you a new mind, he changes what you think. When he gives you a new spirit, he changes who you are. And this transformation happens from the inside out. And it, 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 was, it was an epiphany for me when I realized I actually want to be this person. Even if there are no benefits. By the way, there are not a lot of immediate benefits for humility. Cocky people just present themselves better. There, there are not a lot of immediate benefits for gratitude. Ungrateful people get more because they demand more. There are, there are not a lot of immediate benefits for integrity. Because if you admit it was your fault, you get fired. They don't go, we're so proud of you. You know, I'll thank you for stepping up and telling us the truth. You're fired. And people who lack integrity usually uh, manage to avoid immediate consequences. So you have to realize that, that these changes are so consequential because they actually can produce negative consequences that you have to have an interior motivation that's more powerful than the immediate benefit or consequence. He says, I'm going to move you from the inside out. And, and there's something incredibly liberating about realizing, oh, it's okay if I don't live up to other people's standards. 
because that was never my motivation. My motivation has always been, I just want to be the best version of me. And that's hard work. And, and sometimes I have to dig deeper than I'm digging because that version of me is buried under a lot of other layers <laughs> of me. There's this movie that came out this past year, and um, Killers of the Flower Moon. And it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an image of a very interesting time in uh, U.S. history. And it, it has this interesting backstory of, of how the uh, First Nation people lost the land that they lived on and those who colonized the country and turned it into this modern nation would actually have contracts and we, we would have treaties and then we would break those contracts and break those treaties because they didn't have the military power to force us to keep those contracts. And, and, and so we just kept giving them more undesirable land and then more undesirable land and then more undesirable land and so we gave them the most undesirable land we could find. And since they had no option, they took the most undesirable land. And lo and behold, under this desolate land, they found oil. And then, of course, that's the context of the movie. Once you find out the land has more value than you thought, then you try to kill and steal and to rob. Wow, it sounds like someone Jesus described. And one of the things that really struck me about that film is Sometimes what you think is desolate land is the most viable land available. Have you ever just felt like a desolate land? Just don't have enough talent or enough courage or enough intelligence or education or money or contacts or leverage. You just ever just, everyone else thinks you're okay, but you just feel like a desolate land. And then sometimes you might even wonder, God, why didn't you do more, like with me? And I think what happens so oftentimes is that we're a desolate land because we're still living on the surface of ourselves. But if you just do the hard work and go deep into the soil of who you are, you're going to discover an endless well of wealth. There's oil inside of your soul. Because when you go deep inside of you, guess what you find? You don't find the worst version of you. You find the best version of you. See, if you've ever been afraid, because, you know, there's this whole, I didn't bring this up before, but there's this whole cultural phenomenon of imposter syndrome. And, and somebody was asking me, I was on this podcast with a guy named Tim Ross, and, and he said, we know what do you think about imposter syndrome? I said, well, I don't think we have a syndrome. I think we have imposters. And he goes, oh, you know, just stopped. And, and I, I said, I, I think we think we have an imposter syndrome, but actually what's going on is we actually are imposters. We're, we're, we just spend so much energy being who we're not. And we're just spending so much energy creating an image. And, and so the syndrome is actually a symptom, not a syndrome. It's a symptom of who we are. And and we're terrified because it takes so much energy to be that imposter. We're terrified that one day someone's going to see you right in us. And you know who we're more afraid of? We're afraid that we're going to see ourselves. I mean, what about if you could just strip yourself of all the fake you? Are you afraid to see you, to see yourself? And this is where this covert advantage is such good news. What God is actually saying is, if you ever find the courage to strip away all the persona, you have ever find the courage to strip away all the image, if you ever find the courage to strip away all the imposter, if you'll look in the mirror and see who you really are, it's going to blow your mind because you're more beautiful than you could have ever imagined, more extraordinary that you could have ever conceived. Because I've changed your heart. I've already changed what you want. What you want, so beautiful, so extraordinary, so noble, so honorable. But now we have to go through the journey of changing what you think. And by the way, I think that's the chasm that many people of faith are in. You already want the right thing, the better thing. 
but you haven't learned how to change your thinking. So you're still in your old mind with a new heart, and you've lost your way. And you have to not only begin to actualize this new heart, you have to actualize this new mind and begin to think a new way. It's why I spend so much time talking about mind shifts and mindsets and mental structures. Because your mind is where the battle is fought. It's lost and won there. You need to realize that you also have this new spirit. That God has changed you in your essence. So he says, no longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. So then I will put my spirit in you. God is saying the core of who you are is your relationship and identity in him. I'm just going to bring this up and backtrack to it. Part of what really struck me in reading this particular passage is how we, and I was looking back at generations and decades, and, you know, I'm a product of the 60s. Where, you know, we were the generation of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Very quickly, it turned into the, like, the baby boomer yuppie generation of, no, it's not sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It's success and wealth and power. And then very quickly, it evolved to the generation of, like, of the suburbs even, you know, of, no, it's about safety and security and comfort. And, and you just see each wave and each wave and each wave. And, and we're in a wave right now where we have an entire generation that's being told that the reason you're lost in your soul is because you're in the wrong body. Because you're somehow misplaced. The universe... created a tragic intersection between who you are and, and who you're trapped inside of. And I see so many people struggling with their identity and, and, and told that it, they can transition out of this quandary, this, this, this misconnection between their soul and their body and their mind and their emotions and And the truth is that a new gender, a new sexuality, a new identity isn't going to fix us. Because what God is actually saying is that all of us feel this disconnection. See, all of us feel this fear that somehow we're not whole, that there is something broken inside of us. And, and those poor kids actually think they're the only ones who feel this level of pain and this level of emptiness, this level of loneliness, this level of disconnection. And we need to be honest and say, no, we all feel this. But what God is actually saying is the reason is because what you need is a new you. The solution is a new you and a new me, a new heart, a new mind, a new spirit. Because you were never created to find your identity outside of God. Which is why, by the way, Jesus isn't just the best option. It's why Jesus is our only solution. Because he's the only one that doesn't try to impose change on you. He's the one that has come to create a covert advantage by changing us from the inside out and making us fully human again. What your soul is searching for is that heart of flesh. Your way back to being fully human. The way back to be who God created you to be. And that's what Jesus came to offer us. And maybe if we just realize that we're all in that same struggle. We're all trapped in that same maze. Maybe we could find the courage to say, what your soul's searching for is the one who created you, the one who knows you, the one who loves you, the one who made you, 
You are not an accident. You're not an accident. You're not science. Not artificial intelligence. Not biology. Not medicine can fix the deepest dilemma of the human soul. Only Jesus can heal us where we're broken most. Would you just bow your heads to me just for a moment? You never know, in every room, there might be someone who needs to connect to Jesus. So we want to give you a moment if that's you. If you're here and you know that something's missing, and finally it makes sense today that what's missing is that relationship to the God who loves you and created you. And if somehow in this moment, it all comes together that Jesus came, God himself, to die on a cross so that you could live. And you're ready to put your trust in him. Because the one who rose from the dead can raise you up to life. If you're here and you're ready to trust Jesus with your life, I just want you to whisper a simple prayer. Jesus, I give you my life to him. Just tell him, Jesus, I give you my life. If that's your prayer and you'd like for me to pray for you, I just want you to raise your hand right now. And I just want to see you make a little bit of a heart-to-heart -heart connection. If you whispered that prayer, Jesus, I give you my life, just hold up your hand so I can pray for you. Beautiful. I could feel the fear that you were overcoming when you raised your hand. And I want you to know there's a freedom that comes when you step into your fear and trust God. Father, I thank you that you meet us where we are. That you're the God who came to set us free. You're not the God who tries to control us, to conform us, to limit us. You are the God who knows us in our uniqueness. You designed us you created us. And I pray, Father, even for this person, that you would wrap them up in your love. Let them know they belong to you. That you will never leave them or abandon them. And God, I pray that we would step into the new version of us. For each person here, that you would just be the new you. And find the freedom that comes in that. Thank you, God, that you took that covert advantage and changed us from the inside out. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.